Hello insiders, this week's newsflash. First item, the option to use the classic upload flow will be removed over the next couple of weeks. Next week we'll remove the escape hatch for the first 1% and then 10% of users in early June. As a reminder that new uploads flow has a lot of capabilities that the old one didn't have, including for many YPP channels, the ability to self-certify if your ads are brand suitable. We've also recently added the ability to do bulk uploads to the new uploads experience uh, based on feedback during that uh, earlier beta testing period. If you have anything in the classic uploads flow that you think we missed that it's crucial, uh, let us know. So far, the feedback has been very positive and the error rates for uploads has come down dramatically since that new uploads flow is built on some uh, improved technology. Next item, in case you missed it in our last news flash, we teamed up with four video caption providers who will offer special discounts and benefits for video caption, subtitle, translation services. You can easily link your YouTube account via our integration with these providers and choose which videos to caption in just a few clicks. It's a pretty cool opportunity. Check out more details in the link below. Next, Connor is back with another insight from our unlisted video review program. Take it away, Connor. Hey everybody, Connor here from the YouTube policy team. I'm excited to be back on Creator Insider to share some more insights with you. So today we're going to be focusing on uh, sexual content, uh, sometimes called adult content, um, and, and how it can exist on YouTube. So broadly speaking, content that is intended to sexually arouse or to sexually gratify viewers doesn't belong on the platform. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, content that is educational, maybe like sex ed, um, or is uh, in like a documentary context or is scientific um, or artistic um, and has both um, those intentions and the context to support them uh, generally is allowable on the platform and in some cases can monetize. Um, however, there is obviously a pretty big um, amount of gray area between those two extremes and so I've pulled out a couple of key areas that I'd like to talk through today um, to help clear up some of those top issues. So let's start first with sex education videos. These are suitable for the platform and are generally also suitable for monetization. A couple things to look out for though are uh, conversations of a, of a very personal nature like your specific lived experiences with sex or um, sex tips and those kinds of um, more graphic types of conversations uh, may not be suitable for advertising, um, even if they are allowed on YouTube. Um, one of the questions that I would encourage you to ask yourself is, is the primary impact of your video um, on, on viewers entertainment or education? Okay, so moving on to topic number two, what about nudity? So censored or blurred nudity that is depicted briefly uh, is generally okay for monetization. Um, when I say briefly depicted, I mean uh, not focused on. Um, similarly, depictions of people wearing limited clothing, but in a, kind of a, a context that, it, that you would expect that's reasonable. So, you know, imagine someone wearing a bikini at, at the beach um, is also suitable for monetization. I mentioned the word focused before, um, and I should explain uh, that a little bit more. So if breasts or um, butts or genitals um, are focused on, um, and that could be using um, zooming in or um, camera angles or compiling multiple shots together to direct the viewer's focus, then that is generally not suitable for monetization on YouTube. It's important to note that what I'm saying here about um, these types of depictions applies to both clothed and unclothed people. Um, and besides the potential impact on monetization, uh, these types of depictions also uh, may be age restricted or in certain cases uh, not permitted on the platform. Um, it's probably pretty obvious, but full exposure nudity, so like complete nudity um, is not um, suitable for monetization, nor is it allowed um, on YouTube at all, um, except in a couple very kind of specific cases like I think classical art, um, Michelangelo's David sculpture as an example. Lastly, let's talk about actual sex acts. 
So broadly speaking, depiction of sex acts is, is not permitted on YouTube, um, even when it's implied or it's animated or um, it's only in the audio. Educational, documentary, scientific, um, or artistic intent and context um, might be factored um, into decisions made about depiction of sex acts, um, but generally speaking, um, that type of content would not be suitable for monetization and would likely be age-restricted. So that's our set of insights for you this week. I hope these were valuable for you and I'll see you next time. Next, we've routinely heard from subscribers that they would like additional features on the subs feed to help them catch up with their favorite creators. Based on this feedback, we launched topics in the subscriptions feed on iOS in January to help subscribers browse the feed and catch up with their latest uploads. Topics in the subs feed is now available on Android as well. Next, as part of our efforts to reduce hijacking, starting May 26, new owners of a brand account within the first seven days will no longer be able to remove admins, undelete accounts, or change to the primary owner. Lastly, trivia time. Uh, in the previous news flash, I asked, how would you know how many uploads to do in a given week? If you were concerned about your current viewers, uh, whether or not they were consuming all of the content that you were putting up there, what would be the metrics that you could look at to help inform that decision? The first person to guess it correctly was Ossified, so congrats Ossified. And the answer was if you go to analytics, so you go studio analytics, audience, there's a metric there called uh, average views per viewer. And so if you look at a seven day period, if your average views for, per viewer is let's say one, and you're uploading every day, it may still be a good strategy if you're trying to just get as much content and grow your audience as much as possible. But if you're wondering, wow, am I putting so much out there that my current viewers just like they can't, they don't have enough time to consume all that content, then the average views per viewer in a seven day period could be a good indicator. As an example, if you were doing, uh, let's say once a week uploads, and you were seeing that the average views per viewer was one or 0.7, you might think, wow, they're pretty much consuming everything I put out there. Maybe I should go twice a week. And then if you go to you know two times a week and it's like 1.5 or 1.6, then you're like, wow, they keep taking more. Their sustained interest, even though I'm uploading more frequently. You know, the opposite is true, where if you're uploading daily and the average views per viewer in a seven day period is only one, uh, you may want to kind of curtail that a little bit, get a little bit of time for yourself, or maybe think about those additional videos as mainly just acquiring brand new users, but your current audience um, doesn't yet have the appetite for that many videos. So just something to keep in mind. It's never a, a clean cut answer. I wish I could just tell you, oh, there's a report that will tell you exactly how many videos to upload you know, per week. But this is a good indicator to help you think it through. So for this week, here is my trivia question. There are a number of very easy one-time hacks that you can do to improve the growth of your memberships capability on your channel. So if you've enabled memberships for your channel, what are some things that you could do? You only do it one time and it keeps helping you grow faster uh, subsequently. Put it in the comments below. There's actually a few of them, but uh, I'll just accept the first one and give you a shout out at next week's newsflash. In the meantime, keep it real.